Namaste and welcome to Pods by PEI, a policy discussion series brought to you by Policy Entrepreneurs Inc. My name is Kushihang. In today's episode, which is a special early release, we have PI colleague Somitar Nepani's conversation with Sagar Prasai and Paras Karel on unpacking Nepal's national budget for fiscal year 2023-24. Sagar and Paras sit in a riveting conversation discussing the latest national budget, analyzing its structure, priorities, and impacts. They situate the budget in the current context of an economic slowdown, tracing the historical patterns, factors, and events that have enervated the Nepali economy. Their conversation then informs how the budget responds to contemporary economic challenges and what factors play into the success or failure of its performance. Sagar is a development professional with over two decades of experience working in the areas of water, energy, climate issues, and regional cooperation in South Asia. He currently provides advisory services to various organizations, including the Asia Foundation and the Australia government's DFAT. Paras is a trade economist with over 15 years of research experience. He is the executive director at South Asia Watch on Trade, Economics and Environment and has a PhD in economics from the University of Melbourne. We hope you enjoy the conversation. Welcome to yet another episode of Pods by PEI. And today we are discussing the annual budget for the government of Nepal that was released this May 29th. And I welcome back two of our guests that have been in the show previously, Saga Parsai and Paras Karel. Welcome, guys. Thank you. So much. Thank you. So the budget this year was discussed and delivered amongst realities of the Nepali economy considerably slowing down. So I'm even noting that the economy has the cusp of failing. Before we move on to discuss the budget at length, I think it is best to unpack this notion of economic crisis that surrounds the Nepali economy today. And I want to begin with you, Sagar, to reflect on this notion of crisis that surrounds the Nepali economy. Broadly, what is the state of the economy today and what factors or aspect of the economy point towards this direction of crisis? Yeah, let me start from some of the structural factors. And the story has both uniquely Nepali factors as well as some global regional factors. Mm-hmm. And like everybody else does, you know, the, the story has to be started from Ukraine war, which is, you know, the sort of the root cause of the inflationary pressure that many countries felt particularly from three commodities, edible oil, grain, and fuel prices. And so every time that happens, the household demand tends to slump because you're, of course, spending more on these three commodities compared to before. So that tends to suppress the demand a little bit. And then, if I may say so, we may have had perhaps a reaction to this Sri Lanka crisis disproportionate reaction to the Sri Lanka crisis. We all of a sudden clamped down on our imports. Now, Nepali economy is mostly import dependent. You could almost call it the engine of our growth is import. We do import almost 14 to $15 billion worth of goods. And so when we suppressed imports, that had a reflection on the revenue. And that had other multiplier effects down the lane on the retail sector and so on and so forth. So that was second. Equally important was that this fiscal year we had three different governments, one prior to the election and two after the elections. And every time that happens, there is a significant shakeup in the bureaucracy top to bottom. There were a lot of transfers. And that just restricts, again, our ability to spend the money. So it had some expenditure side impact. Then, whether one likes it or not, you know, excess fat or excess buoyancy in the real estate sector and in the equity markets tend to keep the consumer sentiment as well as investor sentiment high. And we decided to put brakes and very sort of hard brakes on those two sectors. One by limiting margin lending through new rules. And on the other side, on the real real estate sector, 
we halted almost in a screeching halt. We stopped this practice of further dividing land parcels. And so the the game from both ends started to uh, you know look less promising and and so that had an impact on investors as well and then all of these factors put together you know we started to see cash disappear from the market one of the reasons why that also happened is that because we were running a deficit budget the government swept up a lot of the you know uh, domestic credit and banks exposed to real estate and margin lending had to again become very more conservative and their lending also slowed down so much slower lending changes in you know public policy governments changes in our external sector imports rising inflation all of that had pressures on the economy and that's what we're looking at right now would it be fair to also say that all of these factors was just bad timing in the sense that the economy was trying to come back after the slump of covid it was not only trying it was visibly coming back but uh, whether the fundamentals were driving them even then we can't be sure but it was beginning to look better and you know all of these new factors put together some of them global of course but some of them uniquely nepali you know all put together we are in a slump Paras, I want to come to you for the next question. So the Nepali economy, this is not the first time that the ne- Nepali economy has been in crisis. They've been in crisis before as well. But what factors in the current crisis make them different from the previous crisis or maybe in some regards defining that that is what people are calling the current crisis to be? So the finance minister in his budget speech has projected a growth of about 2.1% for the current fiscal year but if you look at you know, quarterly gdp data in the first two quarters of this fiscal year the gdp growth has been negative and in the last quarter of the previous fiscal year also the gdp growth was negative so three successive quarters of negative G- gdp growth in a way technically in a recession this might have happened in the past but we don't know because to my knowledge since the time quarterly gdp estimates were released which is over the last 5 6 7 years this is the first time we have seen this kind of you know three successive quarters of a negative gdp growth but i would like to go back to the year 2018 19 before covid at that time the economy had seen about two at least two years of robust gdp growth in excess of 6% that was largely on the back of reconstruction efforts and the low base effect of the earthquake and the subsequent economic blockage but later on we came to know that even in the first half of 18 19 fiscal year the economic growth rate was already petering out so my interpretation is that the growth momentum generated by reconstruction efforts was already petering out but then covid hit and then all the subsequent reduction in economic growth it's easy to you know attribute that to covid but the economy was already petering out even on the eve of covid that's one point and regarding the current crisis i mean it can be seen through a number of dimensions one is the foreign exchange reserves were drastically declining as imports surged as the pent up demand you know that was suppressed during covid found expression and then the government introduced an import ban on a range of products the central bank also introduced um, cash margins for imports which is another form of import restriction side by side the ukraine war also happened and that constituted an adverse supply side shock to the nepali economy also now so this the current you know slump in the gdp is a combination of these factors but going by the reports of the central bank or the government of nepal or even the world bank it's hard to you know tease out the contribution relative contribution of all these factors right because when the central bank imposed cash margin restrictions to restrict imports it categorically states that imports of raw materials will be exempted and since the manufacturing sector has also suffered if you go by quarterly gdp estimates it might imply that that provision has not been effectively implemented one aspect secondly the construction sector has also slumped a lot 
and what could be the reason? Imports, to my knowledge, are not banned as such that affect the construction sector. It could be that the government's policy of restricting the use of you know, local raw materials in the construction sector briefly in the current fiscal year might have impacted the construction sector. And talking about the crisis, I think regardless of the negative GDP growth, the main crisis in Nepal is with regard to deindustrialization. Right? We prematurely deindustrialize. Our manufacturing as a share of GDP is about 5%. It peaked around the year 1999, when our per capita income was way back. That's why it's highly premature deindustrialization. Secondly, our structural transformation has been very weak. If you look at the period 2008 to about 2018, in a way, the period after the political changes of 2006, coincidentally, we will find that within sector productivity growth right, has been negative. So the growth we have observed has basically arisen from the shifting of labor resources from less productive sector to more productive sector. That's structural transformation. But within productivity sector growth, which augurs well for ultimate structural transformation, has been negative. Similarly, resources have not moved from below average productivity growth sector to above average productivity sector. Rather, it has been the other way around. So that's another point. And secondly, our export performance has been very weak. And then finally, job creation has also been very weak. For example, adult males, Nepali males, the number of adult Nepali males are having a wage job on Nepali soil is almost the same as the number of adult Nepali males working abroad for wage jobs. There are few countries in the world that this happens. This means that the, you know, the system overall has spectacularly failed on the you know, job creation and export growth and structural transformation front. Do you want to add anything to this? Salah? No, I just wanted to qualify my, my statement about maybe we overreacted on the import restrictions. I think Paras used the right word in saying it was the pent-up demand. And whenever somebody calls something a pent-up demand, that means it's unusual, abnormal, and episodic. And so... I feel, although there are a lot of praises being sung about how well the external sector has been managed, I feel that was an overreaction because we had, at that point, data in our hands showing that the it of foreign workers, I mean, Nepali workers going to foreign countries for work, migrant workers, was growing, and it was growing at, it was almost doubling. So one could have potentially anticipated healthier remittance down the line, and maybe we could have stopped ourselves from overreacting. Excellent points. I, I don't think we need to discuss this fact, but you see this debate happening in Nepal as to who is to blame for the current crisis, but clearly there is an historic timeline to the current crisis. Uh, the, the current is the making of the past. In that sense, that crisis actually evolved years ago, and then we've not been actually able to wheel over and address some of these challenges. Coming to challenges, understanding where the economy today is and what challenges it's facing, systemic uh, or, or temporal, whatever that be, is an important starting point for a policy document such as the budget. And in fairness, I did, and I'm assuming you, you guys did also make note of the fact that the finance minister, as he was preparing for the budget, or the system generally has reflected on some of these challenges in, in the budgeting process this year. But still, I felt that there were some assumptions that were really flawed and that translated into maybe not so realistic budget. One of those examples was, for me, uh, the fact that the government maintaining a highly optimistic view that a modest economic growth is still possible next year this has kind of, I think, translated to how the budget has been designed. But in your opinion, and I can begin with you, Paris, do you see some of these flawed or unrealistic assumptions or good assumptions that have been taken into consideration while making the budget? So uh, with regard to assumptions, one notable feature of the budget that I have noticed, especially when comparing to the previous couple of budgets, is that in the initial part of the budget, the finance minister dwells significantly on a range of reforms that do not require any expenditure as such, but the premise seems to be, and to some extent correctly, that 
without certain legal and regulatory policy reforms. It matters little how much you spend or how you allocate your expenditure. So if implemented properly, a set of reforms the government has proposed in the initial part of the budget should deliver something. Excellent. Saga, do you have anything to add on? No, I think that that's, that's a fair assessment. Right, now we can move on to the budget and maybe discuss with the structure and performance of what the budget is all about this year. Most of our listeners are, I think, already aware of the headlines. But just to repeat, the government of Nepal has presented a budget with an envelope size of Nepali rupees 1.75 trillion, roughly around 13.25 billion US dollars. This is around 2.3% less than the previous year's budget. But if you had to look at the revised budget estimates of the government of Nepal, it's actually 16% higher. Sagar, and I want to begin with you here, is what does the structure of the budget look like with regards to expenditure and revenue in detail? So, Samitra, let me take a little bit of a departure here and instead of Arabs and Kharabs use, you know, millions and billions, and it might help our international listeners also. So, this is, and, you know, let's not nitpick. I'm going to use very sort of blunt, uh, rounded off figures, and I'm looking at roughly the last three years. So, you know, our economy, roughly speaking, is a $40 billion economy. We raise, we raise taxes around 20 to 22% of the GDP, which gives us a revenue of around 8 to $9 billion. Uh, we generally present a budget of 13 to $14 billion. And what that leaves us with is a gap of about $4 billion. Of that, we tend to meet around 60% of that gap through domestic borrowing and the rest from international borrowing as well as grants and other sources. This has been the broad structure that hasn't changed, irrespective of what growth we've had in each individual year. On the expenditure side, we expend almost our entire revenue, plus a little sometimes, on just keeping the doors of the government open, which is what, you know, recurrent expenditure means, the component of our social security obligations there too. So what are we left with? You know, after all, budget estimates are estimates, but we keep coming up with a budget estimate of about you know, between 13 to $14 billion, irrespective of the gap. And what we do with the remaining $4 billion is that roughly, depending on which year, 40-45% of that is spent on debt servicing, essentially financial servicing. And the rest goes to capital expenditure, which is what builds our roads and airports and blah, 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 right? So that is the broad structure of the economy. And because, you know, our revenue is way lower than, you know, what it takes even to open, <laughs> open the government for business at times, there isn't much we can play with. And whatever games we play with these allocations, we have to play on the banks of, on the backs of our debt servicing ability. So that's roughly the structure. And, and sometimes I wonder even if I were the finance minister, what else I could do? You know? <laughs> it's a very tight situation, and that's, that's how it usually plays out. And so you can tweak things here and there and so on and so forth. But you know, in terms of allocation, there isn't much. But in terms of implementation, there is a whole lot to do, and that will pick up perhaps later. Just following up, Sagar, I mean, if you were to look at how this structure of the budget has changed over the past years, you make note of some noticeable trends. And one of the things that you pointed out was this increasing cost the economy has to bear to keep the doors open for the government. And probably with federalism, that has increased exponentially. The decreasing cost around capital expenditure. How, how are you to look at this trend? Uh, I will take the federalism question up front and then probably yield to Paris to, to fill in. Uh, 
There is a lot of talk about how federalism has increased expenditure and so on and so forth. Yes, true, it has, because there are layers of government coming up and so on and so forth. But we've kept the whole federalism, federal system inefficient by not working harder on the functional allocation side, which is basically who does what at what levels, right? We haven't done that on education. We haven't done that on in our security, criminal justice sector. We haven't done that in any sector, the water sector, name it, right? So what we have is a lot of concurrent functions and duplications right now. And then, you know, we've also not taken the Provincial Public Service Commission seriously. We haven't filled in the positions we need to fill in and so on and so forth. And obviously that will have a drag on the budget. But, you know, this is just not cost. There are opportunities to actually slim down the government by rationalizing, you know, state functions more and, and, and devolving them in a better manner. So, you know, it's not as if, you know, the U.S. is a federal country doing well. It's the biggest economy. So federalism has got nothing to do with your growth power prospects. Or the your inefficiencies. Exactly. And, and there, is, there is still a lack of seriousness. And it almost sounds as if, you know, federalism is being vilified for the wrong reason. Yeah, excellent point. Paris, you want to add anything beyond the discussion on federalism, on the structure of the budget and trends? So I agree with uh, Sagar's, I think, main point that there's limited room for you know, maneuverability. Given that the revenue that we collect, say, 1,200 billion rupees at most in the current fiscal year, is barely enough or in times, at times just enough to cover the recurrent expenditure. So the rest uh, of the expenditure has to be financed from you know, basically internal borrowing and external borrowing and some small amount of foreign grants. Now, if you look at the revenue to GDP ratio, it's or tax to GDP ratio of Nepal is about 22% or at times 24%. That's one of the very few indicators where we are the leader. Nepal is the leader in among South Asian countries. We lag on a range of growth and development indicators behind other countries. So this brings to the point of you know, expenditure efficiency. So Bangladesh has a much higher growth than Nepal, much higher per capita income than Nepal, but its tax to GDP ratio is much lower than Nepal's. I don't have the exact figure right now, but it's much lower, which means essentially that it is getting a much bigger you know, growth bank for the same revenue buck. So this, well, brings, this is in the case of Nepal. No, yeah. So Bangladesh, with a much lower revenue to GDP ratio, has a much higher growth, which means it has been able to get a much higher, you know, growth bank from the same revenue buck. So expenditure efficiency is also a key element which the government tries to address in the initial part of the budget. Of course, it all boils down to implementation. Now, talking about rationalization of expenditure that Sagar raised. Uh, the government in the current budget does mention at the outset that it will gradually, that's the word it uses, gradually implement the recommendations of Public Expenditure Review Commission. It had formed way back in 2018. And an interesting thing about this commission is that usually commissions are made and, and a person that the current government is comfortable with is appointed to head that commission. Now, this commission was formed at the time of the Oli government. But no one doubts the competence of the person appointed to head that commission with regard to public finance matters. And interestingly, this report was made public only last year on the website of Ministry of Finance, although we had to rely on media reports to have an idea of its content. And it basically states that about, you know, the expenditure can be reduced by up to 30%. And it also points out two ways of reducing expenditure by you know, removing duplication in the structure, including structures with regard to federalism, as Sagar pointed out. That's that's my point. Thank you. Yeah. Before we move on to how the budget has responded to some of these things, there's this one particular observation that I had on the budget, and I was looking at this trend for the last five years. So it's for the first time, and this has struck me quite visibly, is that the allocation on financial management is higher than the capital expenditure. This hasn't happened before in, in the last five years. 
Can you unpack this a bit, Paras, so that our listeners are better able to understand what's happening here and what the broader message is around this cost of financial management being higher than capital expenditure costs? The financial management component is basically repayment of loans the government has taken from domestic sources as well as from foreign sources. Now, that amount is, as you said, higher than that of capital expenditure. So this amount is basically that the government repays to foreign donors or domestic lenders. And this can be in a way considered as recurrent expenditure also. And this arises because we have undertaken debt. And we have undertaken debt because our revenue is not enough to meet our expenditure. Now, if you look at a certain annex in the budget, you'll get the figure of 331 billion rupees. That's what the government is going to pay in the next fiscal year in terms of repayment of interest rate and principal repayment on the loans it has taken. That is about 19 or 20 percent of the total budget. And that has grown compared to the current fiscal year by about 70 percent. That's a huge number. Now, underlying this is the fact that our public debt to GDP ratio has increased over time dramatically over the last seven years or so. It is now about 42% of the GDP. That's more than the target we have set under the SDGs for 2030. And what is that target? That target, it's uh, much lower, lower than, than this, okay. more than this. And it's 2030, and we are just in, in 2023 right now. So we have overshot that target. And this increase in public debt uh, is a combination of a number of factors. One was the initial expenditure on post-earthquake reconstruction, coupled with federalism. And the point about federalism is that uh, people's aspirations were raised, at times unrealistically also, and at times politicians as well as some economists affiliated invariably in the case of Nepal, almost invariably, I should say maybe I am an exception, that affiliated one political party or another, they presented the increase in expenditure due to federalism as a one-time increase, which is not the case. If that were the case, debt as a share of GDP would not have risen like this. And in the current uh, structure, about 400 billion rupees uh, in the current budget has been allocated to as grants, various forms of grants to the province and local governments. Right? And then the federal government, after collecting revenue on its own, will also be parting with about 173 billion rupees as revenue sharing with the provinces and local government. So there are competing claims on the expenditure side, and the revenue comes predominantly from the federal government, right? It, and 50% of our revenue is collected on imports at the border. Partly the federal government uses for its own expenditure, and partly it shares with the local and provincial governments also. Now, this increase in you know, allocation for financial management would directly compete with expenditure for more productive purposes. It could be health, education, building of roads, or even providing grants to the you know, local and provincial governments. And in the next few years, this is set to increase. And interestingly, internal debt is now almost as equal as the external debt. Interesting. I think from a taxpayer's point of view and a public interest point of view, the big question to ask, is it borrowing to keep its doors open or is it borrowing to actually use the money for building roads and airports and drinking water facilities? What's been the case? It's been both. But, you know, the, the cost of debt servicing rising is sometimes, most of the time, bad news, but sometimes it can be a good news. Obviously, 70% rise is never a good news. Why I say sometimes it can be good news is the purpose of that borrowing should be a spurring of growth. And if you manage your, your fiscal allocations well, if you, you know, tighten your governance, if you do a better job of managing the economy, then the result should be higher growth. And once you have higher growth, you have higher revenues, and that usually ends up paying the debt. But what we have is a combination of rising debt and mismanagement, which is not a good thing. Yeah, this is something that people need to be more observant yes, about. Absolutely. And government. then taxpayers have a reason to be, you know, at least be able to raise questions around this issue. Nothing. 
I want to move the conversation now to this issue of budget performance. It's almost become standard practice that the government comes up with a budget and the diagnosis that follows is that people call it inflated, ambitious, unrealistic. And a few months down the line, the government discreetly revises the budget targets and etc. And one of the factors that contribute to this is missing revenue targets, which probably comes from taxes or development partner funding or other sources. So how do you assess this changing context of the base of revenue and the thinking around the government on how it's going to manage its fund vis-a-vis what's happening regionally, globally, or in the domestic front? Yeah. So going back to that idea that we're borrowing faster and not growing, let me put it the other way, we're borrowing faster and growing slower. And so that's a predicament. It's, it's a problem, challenge, right? And in some ways, the budget never gets implemented in full, as in the allocations don't get utilized. Uh, and like we said, you know, a lot of our revenue as such is, you know, sunk into recurrent expenditure. So what we're doing when we don't implement the budget well is we're also concurrently limiting the borrowing, Right. So that's the only silver lining in the inefficiency that this government shows, and the Nepali government has been showing for a long time. If we actually spend the entire sum, the estimated allocations, right, our debt would be even higher. But I, at this point, want to raise a rather difficult question. Are they doing it intentionally or not? As in, they fully know that we can't spend the money but to make the budget speech sound good, we will inflate the allocation. And then knowing that we won't be spending it, that way we keep borrowing in check. So do you expect another round of revision for the budget that has been proposed? Oh, oh absolutely, yeah. Sticking to this idea of fund mobilization, it's a unique predicament for the Nepali economy today. And Paras, I want to come to you for this question around domestic borrowing. So I was going through the budget, and one of the largest expenditure ticket that was identified in the budget was servicing domestic borrowing cost, payments for domestic borrowing. This was 15.75% of the anticipated expenditures for the government of Nepal, way higher than sectoral budgets. For example, the Ministry of Education had a ticket for around 11% of the budget, the Ministry of Energy, Water Resources, and Irrigation had a ticket for around 5%, considering the government says that it's going to build so much transmission lines and hydropower projects and etc. So this is clearly a really strong push towards domestic borrowing. What, what I want to get, get from you is this, this trend around increasing reliance on domestic funds, its weak capacity to spend. We've seen cycles of liquidity tightening in the economy. Sagar also raised this point whether this is really purpose on the, on the part of the government. But what are the broader impacts this, this has on the Nepali economy? So the government of Nepal's internal debt is now almost as high as external debt. And it is easier for the government to borrow from domestic sources, which is basically by issuing a treasury bills through the central bank or by issuing development bonds than by borrowing from foreign sources, like the World Bank or Asian Development Bank, for example. But one, you know, but one flip side to this is that whereas borrowing from foreign sources will inject a net you know, amount of money or liquidity into the economy, borrowing from domestic sources is basically you know, competing with domestic actors, notably the private sector, for the same pool of funds that exists within the territorial limits of the country or in the, on our banking system. And one theoretical argument is that this could lead up to a crowding out of private sector investment because the private sector will also be borrowing from the same banking system or the public, the Nepali public. And w- w- the private sector is already complaining about the tightening monetary policy, which partly had to be taken because in the wake of COVID, with the fiscal policy side doing, delivering little, the central bank you know, unveiled its you know, war chest and pumped in a lot of money by way of refinance. 
now when the government borrows more internally, then interest, there will be definitely an upward pressure on the interest rate. And if that money is not used for, say, productive purposes, then it will be even more detrimental to the economy. Now, the government in the current budget somewhere mentions that funds mobilized through borrowing, I think internal borrowing, will be used for you know, development expenditure or capital expenditure, which to me is perhaps a witting or unwitting admission that internal borrowing of late is being used for, to even finance non-development expenditure or re recurrent expenditure, as has been argued in the media. Because just by looking at airline numbers of you know, the national accounts or the Rastra Bank's data, one cannot say for sure whether that's the case, but this might be an admission of that aspect. So now it's de rigor for the critics of any budget, right, when the budget comes out, to say that the you know, public borrowing target is unrealistic or that the, the expected foreign loans won't materialize or in the case of domestic borrowing, it will, you know, crowd out. So, but what could be the solution? Ultimately, expenditure has to be kind of curtailed. And the commission's report that I mentioned earlier says that up to 30% can be reduced. Since many economists across the political spectrum, you know, interestingly, are quoting that report, I think what's needed is an action plan proper to implement that report. Because it's rare for a report of a commission to you know, acquire this kind of, I should say, bipartisan support across economies, across the political spectrum. So instead of the government saying that gradually we'll implement the recommendations of this, the report of this commission, it should have also said that we develop an action plan by this state to implement the recommendations of that report. Just, just linking this to a discussion we were having prior to this recording, Sagar, on the need for financial prudence, but the current government kind of not trending that line and then trying to resort to monetary tools to raise funds and not using its financial prudence to kind of expand that fiscal space. Yeah, I mean, in, in that sense, you know, th there is a strange case of none of the parties actually trusting the, you know, the government itself because, you know, they run the government by turn so to speak, and everybody knows what precisely the government is capable of and what it is not capable of. And so none of the political voices here trust the government to do a better job on the fiscal side. That is why an expansionary budget or you know, a deficit budget is viewed very skeptically. I'll give you an example. There was two assertions by the current finance minister which actually dampened, I would say, the consumer sentiment, I mean, the, particularly the investor sentiment in this country. The first one was to say that, you know, there isn't much scope in the fiscal instruments. We will solve this, you know, economic problem and revive this sort of slumping economy through monetary policy now. That's not quite how it is to be because, you know, we do in the end produce a budget that is around, you know, 20, 25% of our GDP. In fact, more, I would say it reaches 30% of the GDP. So if you're sitting on top of 30% of the GDP, you can't point the finger to monetary policy alone. So that, that was a bad signal. The other signal was, interestingly enough, you know, we have a pre-existing, you know, uh, we have pre-existing contract instruments to the tune of 400 billion rupees. For any finance minister which wants to inject cash into the economy, there is no better way than to resort to these existing instruments. All you had to do was to put money through the instruments. What ended up happening on the other end was that the contractors were not being paid, there's delayed salaries and so on and so forth. And so that, that created additional pressure and also dampened the, the sentiment. And so to say that, you know, I've got, I've got 400 billion worth of instrument, but I don't have money and therefore I don't know what to do. So when, when you say contract instrument, just for a distance, that means paying off for contracts that- These are contracts for. that the government has signed for different projects. And, you know, you can make the money flow through them. But the choice here is to be very conservative and also to delay the payment. 
<laughs> just something light <laughs> as we're having this serious conversation. We know of some borrowers who tend to borrow to service their own debt. Is that a case for the Nepali government as well? Is that it's borrowing more for its financial management services? Or are we heading towards that direction? I think some part of the uh, internal borrowing that the government does is being used uh, to repay its loans. And an admission to that effect is in the government's announcement that henceforth it will use internal borrowing for productive purposes. Excellent. We've talked enough about resources being one of the key constraints for budget performance. Well, if you were to put some of these things aside and look at budget performance as a factor of bureaucratic culture, capacity, and performance, where do we stand, Sagar? Very bad. And that, that has been a problem. All we can manage to do because salaries are paid through you know, bank accounts and so on and so forth. <laughs> That's the only money that we are able to spend on time, which is not a bad thing, you know. This whatever government pays goes into households, and that you know they consume from that, and that creates a demand in the economy. But on the on the capital expenditure side, I think we are regionally the by capability the weakest. Paris mentioned cost overruns and time overruns. It is difficult to find a single project where that hasn't happened. We give capital expenditure figures and say we'll meet this portion of the capital expenditure through foreign loans. But the utilization of those loans is extremely poor. Sometimes it's in single digits, right? And so we still have not claimed significant amounts that are you know pledged to us because we haven't implemented projects on the ground we keep signing new agreements and slowing them too right so there is a significant budget implementation problem particularly on the capital expenditure side and there are many reasons why this has happened i mean there are some archaic cultures around how we approach expenditure, around procurement, around a variety of things. There is, you know, our anti-graft bodies, for instance, they, instead of using precise tools, they use fear-mongering tools, and some of the bureaucrats complain about being reticent, about being hesitant, about, you know, moving things faster. Then there are frequent transfers of officials, and then, you know, one person is there, it takes the process to a certain point, and then there is another person coming in. And you know this term, setting. The setting gets disturbed, right? And so that slows down a lot of these things every time there is a transfer or a change of minister and things like that. So there are a variety of reasons. I mean, maximum number of reforms are required, although there are some strict instructions coming from this budget saying that within a month you have to write all your guidelines and finish your allocations and move all the procedures. At the end of the fourth month, you should have all the tenders out, otherwise we'll take the money back and so on and so forth. Those are good measures, but I have doubts even if they can implement those measures. So there is a lot of gap on the implementation side. Well, excellent point, Sagar. I think this is now a good segue for us to discuss how the current budget responds to some of these challenges in the economy, as well as the reforms required on the process side of implementing the budget. I did note that the budget had set out 10 key policy priorities. Let's not go into that, but there have been a lot said about what the government is going to do for the next fiscal year. A lot of pronouncements. I see that to be a mixed bag of some commendable initiations, some reputations, some controversial, and some questionable inclusions. We would need an episode each for to discuss some of these things, but just from your own sides and from my side as well, I'll try to, let's put together some of the things that, that struck out for us on, on some of these allocations. And Paris, maybe you can begin with what were some of your key things that you noticed on this budget that struck you? With regard to allocations and... Yeah, yeah, programs and allocations or policies itself. So to begin with, uh, the set of reforms the government has identified at the outset of the budget, if implemented, would be a major achievement. And compared to past budgets, I think that's a 
in a way a departure to my knowledge that has outlined a set of reforms which are a prerequisite for the other stuff that comes after that, the allocations and the revenue generation side. And what those reforms are, we have already briefly discussed about them. Now, coming to the investment side, the government has stated that it will review laws related to leasing land for manufacturing industries and export-oriented industries and also review the ceiling of land ownership with regard to manufacturing industries and export-oriented industries. Now, how it will be implemented is a key aspect, but I think this is an important point because land being very expensive is a critical constraint for Nepal's manufacturing industry. And making land available through industrial areas and special economic zones will help reduce the cost of production overall. And the government has also made a provision whereby it says there will be no floor to the foreign direct investment flows for the IT industry. Because the IT industry representatives have frequently complained that they do not require huge capital requirements so that even the now lowered FDI floor of about maybe 2 crore rupees is too high for them. And the government has categorically stated that there will be no FDI floor at all for the IT industry. And the third point about investment provision is that the government has announced that firms that export IT-related services will be allowed to obtain up to 10% of the foreign exchange earnings that they have made over the last few years to set up a liaison office abroad so that they can market and brand their products and to purchase software which they need as inputs and then to install equipment. This will also help unlock Nepal's IT export potential with regard to investment. And one other provision with regard to investment is that the government has said that it will initiate the process of Nepal obtaining sovereign credit rating. Now, this can be partly linked to LDC graduation because once we graduate from LDC, one argument is that if we do a credit rating, then we'll get a higher score than we otherwise would have because we are no longer the poorest among the poor countries. There is a consensus of sort among stakeholders that without sovereign credit rating, it will be extremely difficult for Nepal to mobilize more investment from foreign capital. And this is very important for Nepal because right now, remittances are greater than foreign direct investment plus foreign borrowing plus foreign grants plus exports of goods and services. That's on the investment side. So the government also announced that it will speed up the process of establishment and implementation of special economic zones, industrial areas, and industrial villages. Well, these aren't new, though. Yeah, these are, these are not new. Now, the key question is to implement it properly. And I should add that to link industrial villages with industrial areas and special economic zones so that special economic zones, if and when they fully take off, do not become enclave-like structures, which we know from the global literature. And here, although the government has not explicitly mentioned it, I think the government has a provision for mobilizing private investment for the establishment of industrial areas. I think it's also important to attract FDI to not just manage, but even set up and manage special economic zones. We can draw in investors with experience in neighboring countries, including from China. Because setting up and efficiently operationalizing special economic zone is an entirely different ball game in which we don't have experience. And we have entered this special economic zone game quite late. It was only in 2016 that a special economic zone act came into being, whereas many other South Asian countries had a special economic zone way back. And the government has lowered the threshold to get facilities in an export in a special economic zone. Currently, a firm needs to export at least 60% of its output in order to qualify for special export-related incentives. Now that has been reduced to 30%. This has had long been demanded by the private sector and was identified as a reason why 
there weren't many takers of spaces or lots in the existing special economic zone. Mm-hmm. This reduction from, initially it was 80%. There weren't many takers apparently. It was reduced to 60% and now it has been reduced to 30%. So this is a kind of a sad commentary on the state of our productive capacity. Usually special economic zones are to spur exports. And it looks like despite the provision of a range of incentives, we don't have the requisite productive capacity or maybe the required entrepreneurship to use SEZs as launching pad for exports. And the government has also said that it will review, which apparently most probably means reduce, the land rental rate in special economic zones. So this has also been a long-standing demand of the private sector. But ultimately, the test would lie in how much exports increase because of this. Uh, And on the export uh, front, the government has allocated 900 million rupees, close to 1 billion rupees, for export cash incentive. This is just a continuation of previous programs, but the government says that export cash incentives to eligible exporters will be released within three months. This is apparently in response to the constant complaint of the private sector that the bureaucratic process and hassles involved in getting access to these incentives, even if they qualify for them, is you know deterring them. Now, one p- point with regard to this is that the government has not properly evaluated the impact of cash incentive, as with other types of subsidies, including a- agriculture subsidies. World Bank had done a study a few years ago with just a few years' data on the impact of export cash incentives, and it had concluded that the impact is minimal or negligible, and that these incentives have basically been cornered by relatively large industries. I think one provision that the government could have introduced, but it did not, was that to allocate a certain percentage of export cash incentives to cottage and small enterprises that export, right? Because right now, these incentives are being provided on a first-come, first-served basis. So relatively large firms uh, who can um, assign uh, or dedicate uh, members of their staff to look into these processes and move through these uh, hoops of you know, hassles and procedures will be cornering most of these subsidies. So allocating a part of those subsidies uh, to the cottage and small industries, I think, is a worthwhile approach in future. So uh, is it fair to say that the clear winners and losers in this case with regards to subsidies for export the larger industries winning and smaller SMEs losing out? Based on limited available evidence, that appears to be the case. And that's why one way to address it would be to allocate certain percentage to cottage and small enterprises, right? Assuming that export gas incentives for exports are okay. Because one other argument could be that instead of providing these export gas incentives, one could pool these resources into a single fund, say 1 billion rupees, and then provide services that are in public good or services nature. For example, you could provide subsidies for firms to obtain, say, organic certification. We could use these subsidies to help small or cottage firms or industries, their representatives, to participate in international trade fairs or hold similar trade fairs, if feasible or relevant, in Nepal, which will benefit a broader section of firms and industries. And a few firms cornering subsidies would be less of an issue or a problem in that case. On the revenue side, the government you know, declares in point 458 that it will ensure that there will at least be a difference of one slab in customs duties between raw materials used by industries and the final products they compete with. Now, this is hackneyed stuff, right? All governments want to ensure some form of effective rate of protection, right? But if you consider the publications of Nepal's leading donor, the World Bank, what you will see is that one of the you know, distortions in the economy, it points out, which according to the World Bank is constraining our growth potential, is high effective rates of protection. It wants these effective rates of protection to be narrowed down as far as possible so that resources can flow to sectors in which we have genuine comparative or competitive advantage. Now, I do not subscribe fully to the you know, World Bank's argument, but what I'm suggesting is that a clear vision idea is needed. Right? So 
whenever these uh, you know duties are changed it raises suspicion among stakeholders okay. as often the case so to prevent that from happening uh, the government should do research on its own and once we have clarity then the government the finance minister or the ch- vice chairman of the national planning commission or prominent e- economists aligned with different political parties can then with confidence tell our development partners also okay all countries afford some sort of effective rate of protection on certain sectors these are the sectors we offer effective rate of protection this is needed for industrialization but we have also a sunset clause and the certain issues are non negotiable we are doing it in a transparent manner so right now that does not seem to be the case overall no excellent i i had a question for you down the road on what was the budget's outlook on trade and i think you've kind of answered that sagar do you have things to complement to what paris is raised maybe other issues well <clears throat> if you permit me somitra i want to take this question in a slightly lighter note so i have picked three stories from the budget one good story one bad story and one missing the bus story the good story is if you've ever visited a government compound you will see in one corner of the compound bunch of dilapidated cars from 20 years ago and vegetables growing out of their seats and so after years and years of sort of looking at that i saw and waste of resource and so on and so forth at least in my lifetime finally the finance minister said that we will auction them in 6 months time so when you perhaps if it gets implemented again when you go visit a government office you are less likely to see that i saw so that for me is the good story the bad story is the resurrection of nizgard airport now we've had now experience of two international airports although they were predominantly designed for tourism purposes we've, we've and we've discussed it that it wasn't you know the market has to respond and for the market to respond you know you have to take care of all the things like landing rights and so on and so forth prior to opening these airports now they become sort of white elephants and so we've got a pair of white elephants sitting there the nijgarh airport is particularly problematic of course it's problematic from the environmental end but you know from viability end it is absolutely problematic because the argument 20 years ago when this was conceptualized was that you know this would become somehow a hub between east asia and west asia because at that time the the narrow body aircraft used to fly for roughly 5 that used to be the range roughly 5 hours and whatever up to 6 hours now both airbus and boeing the predominant sort of commercial manufacturers of jet have come up with engines that fly for 8 hours and 8 and 1/2 hours very easily that means they can handle all of that traffic through direct flights so that essential recognition that the engine technology has t- changed the efficiencies have changed and how traffic management has changed is not even now realized by nepali government and they're hellbent on putting a international airport putting billions of dollars into an airport that is just barely 70 kilometers away from Kathmandu and for a country like Nepal do we need four airports or not but you can see that it never stops the story never stops that is the bad story now the missing the bus story comes from a pronouncement made from the rostrum of the parliament by the finance minister saying that he is finally going to open the production of ganja in Nepal and when he said that the whole house sort of smirked and laughed as if to say you know now we're taking up taboo subjects in the parliament it's a classic missing the bus story because all our markets you know whether you call it whether it's us or europe all of them have already opened up they have done much better job on on ganja production than we ever can secondly a lot of our sort of indigenous strains now have been taken out they've been smuggled out and they're grown in amsterdam and other you know ganja growing centers and there is really no point now getting into that business because neighboring countries like thailand india has opened up medicinal production for a long time and so this is really absurd because really you realize it's so late 
And then as late as this, now you're going to say that it is not the actual opening, but we're studying whether we should be opening it or not. And then when that announcement is made, there, is, there are smirks and smiles all over saying, Ooh, this is a taboo subject. So that's my missing the bus story. Uh, really good examples. My own submissions without examples would be, I found a couple of things really interesting. One of them was uh, this whole idea of facilitating infrastructure projects. So provisions around how to expedite EIA and forest clearances, land acquisition, establishing delivery accountability, and workforce movements around projects just to ensure that projects get over the line quicker, they're procured quicker, and all of these. These were really interesting stories for me. The other one was this particular idea that was presented on social protection. It was called, a literal translation would be womb to tomb, social protection, so a comprehensive social protection framework. Nothing's been said about this in the budget. As Paris rightly mentioned, you can't mention everything there. So I'm eager to look into how this conversation evolves for the government as, as we move forward. The other interesting bit was recognizing the role of private sector in power trading. So we've conversed before on power trading, looking at opportunities on the Indian side and addressing some of the constraints there is in the sector today. So this would be interesting to see how it evolves. The other point was on the government's position on sand and gravel extraction and export. And I'm slightly divided on this. Well, this is a resource, but with climate change and some of the environmental concerns that we've been discussing off lately, this could be really a sore thumb sticking out for the government, if at all anything. The last point that I want to, to raise on, on some of these programs is this whole idea of the constituency development fund. So the previous year's budget had taken this out. Uh, there was a lot of hue and cry. Uh, this year, the government's brought it back in, uh, where they're going to allocate 50 million Nepali rupees per electoral constituency. All of that adds up to a ticket of around 8 plus billion. This is a pretty large part of money that is being allocated, and there have been enough reports, coverage around um, the general state of poor governance associated with how these funds are managed. I was going through the budget and I was trying to look at what the 8 billion plus could do or could be used. Otherwise, a similar allocation that the government had put was to support 322 local governments develop 5, 10 or 15 bed hospitals. And this was more than the combined allocation for several ministries, including that on land cooperatives and poverty elevation. So really strange. How, how do you see the comeback of the Constituency Development Fund? Yeah, I mean, it reflects on how our politics has been, and it's always been about sort of distributing goodies one way or the other, and so that politics hasn't changed. And I have no reason to doubt that this will be ever stopped. I don't think it will be stopped. A better... He did come with a qualifier saying that the project has, has to be at least 10 million rupees in size, which is a welcome thing. But what I would really like to see now that the money will go for sure in, that, in this fashion is to have perhaps they can choose one sector every, you know, from this year's budget to put five years in a term. For five years, you pick five sectors and you invest in five sectors each year. That way, at least, it'll be sectorally concentrated, and there might be some synergies and multipliers possible from that kind of spending. Paris, a question to you. So uh, you were here last time at POTS by PEI talking about Nepal's LDC graduation story. And just linking that to the current budget, I did take note that the budget also kind of spells out Nepal's LDC graduation challenges and the kind of need to respond to it. Do you think there are enough sensitivities there that are required to kind of support Nepal's transition to LDC, out of LDC? Yes, the, the, the budget announcement in paragraph 159, it mentions that it will come up with a policy to address the challenges arising from and utilize the you know, arising from Nepal's LDC graduation in 2026. And it also says that sectoral programs to address the shocks will be determined or identified. 
Now, this looks very generic or, you know, hackneyed. But then, to be fair, what more can a government, you know, introduce you know, in its budget statement, which is already um, being very long, to address LDC graduation issues? Now, the government's nodal agency that is responsible for overall coordination on LDC graduation matters is the National Planning Commission, and it is preparing. It is in the final stages of finalizing, actually, transition strategy to ensure that Nepal's graduation from the LDC group is sustainable, irreversible. And then the Nepal Trade Integration Strategy, the new version, which was until recently in cabinet, also has a component addressing LDC graduation. So ultimately, how uh, this provision is implemented depends on the implementation of that component of Nepal Trade Integration Strategy, which has outlined you know, strategies in detail, and then the transition strategy being prepared by the National Planning Commission. This, uh, the emphasis on sectoral programs to be determined by the government in the budget statement, I think, is important. Because we know from several studies, including the one that I did at Sauti, is that the bulk of the impact will be faced in the textiles and apparel sector. So we have always argued that a sector-specific you know, strategy to address the, the shocks that that sector will face is important. And perhaps it is with this in mind that the government has mentioned that sectoral programs will be introduced. And it also mentions that Bilateral talks will be initiated with the European Union, explicitly it identifies European Union and the United States. European Union because the bulk of the losses will be concentrated in the European Union market as well as in the UK market. It also identifies the US market, but the impact on the US market will be very limited because of the structure of our export basket to the US market. I think if it really wanted to explicitly mention countries it wants to have bilateral talks with, it should have also mentioned China. Because whereas we have not been able to fully utilize to a huge extent the preferences accorded by China, after graduation, unlike in the European Union or the United Kingdom, where the preferences will be extended by at least another three years, and after that there are alternative schemes like the GSP Plus in the European Union or the Enhanced Preferences Framework in the United Kingdom, there is no such alternative, almost equally good schemes in the case of China. So bilateral talks with China are also needed. So uh, that's about it with regard. Uh, it's excellent points. I mean, we could go at length talking about the budget because the finance minister himself spoke for three hours. <laughs> 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 A post-diagnosis could go on for <laughs> I don't know how many hours. And we need to bring this episode to a close. But before we, we go there, I mean... I want to end with, uh, with this question that we, we are all grappling with, it's, uh, the implementation question. The proof is in the pudding. We have the ingredients, good or bad, but the pudding still needs to be cooked. So as, as we kind of discuss this question of implementation, as you're parting submissions for the episode, what are some of the things that you, you think are going to be relevant? And I want to start with you, Sagar, and, and maybe just kind of tease out that question of, of the state of politics and whether that is really supportive of, of a good implementation or a possible good implementation? See, I think number one question is stability, right? So, I mean, uh, th there have been assertions that, you know, from now on there would be less transfers and, you know, officials uh, deployed in projects can stay there for the duration of the projects and so on and so forth. I doubt if that would be followed because uh, such restrictions on frequent transfers have been in the books for a long time. But if the government itself falls and there is a extended period in which a replacement doesn't come or you know other things can happen, that those are uncertainties. There are additional uncertainties in the in the external sector too, geopolitically and otherwise, and, you know. And so we don't know. But like I said. In the beginning itself, we don't know what the intention is. Is it the intention to actually implement the budget to the fullest? Or is it to stop around 80-85% and then, and then pack your bag and, and plan for the next year? And that way they can uh, total net burden, sort of debt burden, and pat their backs. Excellent. 
your parting thoughts Paris so in in my view the you know the litmus test or the critical test with regard to implementation lies in in how the government implements a couple of pro- reforms it mentions at the outset of the budget for example getting an action plan ready for the programs by mid july and then regular monitoring by the prime minister's office finance ministry and the national planning commission and then by mid august getting ready a work procedure or directives for the approved programs programs approved by the relevant ministry and agency and there are also a, a couple of other provisions with regard to public procurement and holding these contractors private sector contractors accountable or even going to the extent of scrapping their licenses if they are found not to be t- delivering and to be acting in a very careless manner that's the word careless the government uses now that has drawn a sharp you know reaction a critical reaction from the private sector contractors association already so whether it will be implemented or not is a big question but but we'll be able to know good or bad right the implementation you know trajectory by seeing how these critical points are implemented and we'll know you know within 4 5 months so the first i think there's an, going to be an indication towards implementation in the first two months itself right so that's a point that we should probably look at of how the commitments are moving forward absolutely i'm going to look for whether the junkyard has been cleared or not <laughs> All right, excellent conversation guys. And thank you so much for making time to come into the studio. I I think this is going to be helpful for a lot of our listeners. Thank you once again and with that we end the episode. Thank you. Thanks for listening to Pods by PI. I hope you enjoyed Soumitra's conversation with Sagar and Paras on unpacking Nepal's national budget for fiscal year 2023 and 24. Today's episode was produced by Nirjan Rai with support from Hridesh Sapkota, Sonia Jimmy, and me, Khushi Hang. The episode was recorded at PEI Studio and was edited by Hridesh Sapkota. Our theme music is courtesy of Rohit Shakyo from Zindabad. If you liked today's episode, please subscribe to our podcast. Also, please do us a favor by sharing us on social media and leaving a review on Spotify, Apple Podcast, Google Podcast, or wherever you listen to the show. For PEI's video-related content, please search for Policy Entrepreneurs on YouTube. To catch the latest from us on Nepal's policy and politics, please follow us on Twitter at Tweet2PEI. That's T-W-E-E-T followed by the number 2 and P-E-I. And on Facebook at Policy Entrepreneurs, Inc. You can also visit PEI.Center to learn more about us. Thanks once again from me, Kushi. We will see you soon in our next episode.